broadly, is one of the most important issues of the day. Uh, thanks for taking time from your busy schedules to join us to review how the United States is responding to the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It's a United Nations treaty that was ratified by the U.S. in 1994 when President Clinton uh, was president. We want to deal with a slice of this lengthy document having to do with the criminal justice system. There are many more things that it covers. We can't do it all. In May, our division held a review of the U.S. human rights record on two other important topics, protecting the rights of women and girls and on issues related to human trafficking. We have so many amazing people in this room representing either their organizations or their own passions for human justice uh, that um, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you belong to one of these groups. Non-governmental organizations that work with parts of the uh, criminal justice system or in the community. Who is in one of those? Okay. Uh, students. Two of our students are out there. There's one. Okay. Lawyers. Do we have lawyers in the room? If not, I think we will. Uh, health professionals. George. Uh, human rights activists. Media representatives. UNA board members people who are here for this reason, and other UNA members. So thank you everybody for coming. I hope everybody who's not yet a member will uh, consider joining us. We've passed out brochures and you've got my business card. We can tell you how to join. Uh, in the coming months, we're going to follow up on today's work uh, by reporting the results and then by publicizing them in our communities and with our elected officials. If your organization would be interested in co-signing or joining in this report, please let me know. Three distinguished speakers will help get us started. Joshua Cooper, Sean Pica, and Damon Jones. Uh, Joshua will tell us about the convention and how it operates and how we can make our voices heard. And I understand that at the break we'll get some breaking news also. Uh, Sean will talk about higher education as an important step toward reducing repeat offenses by those who are released from prison and helping communities and families in the process. And Damon will discuss the special role of black law enforcement officers in the criminal justice system and in the community. I would also like to invite Dr. William Carter to speak briefly. He is commissioner at the Theodore Young Community Center and the Department of Community Resources in the town of Greenberg. We'll then divide into two groups, and you'll, you'll have your choice of those. We'll do it by facing this wall and that flip chart, or that wall and that flip chart. Uh, so you may want to shuffle ch chairs. Group one is going to focus on the policies related to education in prison and on means of reintroducing offenders into the community. Group two will focus on youth, including youth offenders, school discipline, drugs, and drug use while in school. And I'm hoping that both groups will consider how this relates to racial discrimination and cover insofar as possible differences that relate to blacks, Hispanics, Muslims, including people of Middle Eastern descent, women, mentally ill, HIV, AIDS, um, sufferers, health care prevention, and undocumented. We cannot cover the gamut, but we may want to make references to these as we, as we discuss. A number of written resources are available to your small groups. So if you need a figure of fact, you may be able to check it. We also have access, I understand, from Ryan to uh, Wi-Fi here. Uh, copies are available of a report by the sentencing project that was completed this month and of the entire uh, ISERD. Now, how timely can we be? Only last Tuesday, Senators Cory Booker and Rand Paul proposed the Redeem Act for passage by Congress. And we have copies of that. 
Uh, its purpose is to give Americans convicted of nonviolent crimes a second chance for the American dream. On the same day, Governor Cuomo announced the Council on Community Reentry and, Re and Reintegration. And I think we have some representatives who are on that council here. The intent of that is to provide solutions to alleviate barriers to reentry experienced by formerly incarcerated New Yorkers. So, and not to spend more time on, on this and to turn to Joshua. Joshua, you have their bios on the back page of the program. So I won't do it for you. <laughs> no reason. Joshua, welcome to the gathering back here. Aloha. It's an honor to be here today. I just returned yesterday from Geneva and we actually were meeting with the Secretary on the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination to prepare for the review of the United States in mid-August. So it is an exciting time. Actually, 2014 is probably a year like no other for people interested in human rights in the United Nations. Uh, there are actually 10 human rights treaty bodies, of course. We've only ratified three of them and we're actually being reviewed by all three this year. We'll never have this chance again, I'm sure, for a long time. And more importantly as well, even after they review the civil and political rights, which we just did in March, there will be the review on racial discrimination this August, and then there will be the review of, on torture and other cruel and humane treatment in November. Another important point is next April, May, there will be a review of the Universal Periodic Review that looks at all human rights from the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, any visit by a rapporteur to our country, and more importantly, it's a second chance at things that didn't come up in CERT or that there haven't been enough actions on racial discrimination since the review in August. It's a chance to reinforce our recommendations. So it's a, it's a very powerful time. These treaty bodies are important in that they allow people in our country to provide information on what we believe is the true situation on the ground. They're usually based in a couple of different ways. They have five phases. There's a preparation phase where the government will write a report saying how it's doing, in this case related, related to racial discrimination. They'll be looking at the international you know, convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination known as CERD. Of course, we all know in our committees, no one knows what these acronyms are, that they even exist. So it's kind of important thing to engage people. Otherwise, people think CERD is a breath mint or something else and have no idea it's important. Uh, these international instruments have 18 experts. The 18 experts review the, looks like we're playing hockey puck with us. Those are where we place the agenda or a bottle. So it's the same thing. <laughs> what we're doing at the global level is placing uh, the U.S. racial discrimination record on the global agenda, just as way you put it all on your coaster. And that will take place very soon. The reason we're having these meetings is because it allows us to actually give a grade to our government, say what is going on, what is going well, but what needs to be improved, and also more important to say what we want. The U.S. report is already written, people can look at that, but more importantly, we get to write a shadow report, they're called, where you go article by article and point out either what the U.S. saying is absolutely true, or more importantly, look at what questions we think these experts should ask our government, and more importantly, what recommendations. So we have National Security Prisons here in New York. We have 334 men and women currently enrolled in college programming. We've given 349 degrees in the past 14 years. We're in Taconic Correctional Facility for the women, Sing Sing for the men, Green for the men, Fish Kill for the men, and Sullivan for the men. It's two max prisons and three medium prisons. When the folk, my mom and dad are retired New York City cops, they don't like what I do. They spent their career putting people in prison. The idea that we we'll reward them with, uh, well, that education to reward is a whole other argument, but that we we'll reward them is an argument in my family. Um, but the fact of the matter is, not a single one of our graduates went back to prison in the first 13 years. Now, if you take that times $54,000 a year, times the 60% national recidivism rate, we're saving New Yorkers millions of dollars a year for something they're not even paying for. Now, we've been really, really lucky with folks like Whoopi and the Buffets and Harry Belafonte and Tim Robbins and Ice-T that have the means to support what we're doing and believe what we're doing and have vocalized that. We made a movie last year called the Sing Sing, uh, University of Sing Sing that aired on HBO this year. Uh, those things have helped us be legitimate, 
because you could do great work and not be legitimized for it. All of a sudden you're on HBO and, oh, that, that sounds interesting. Um, and also, just to, uh, to take it a little bit further, when I was arrested, I was in the ninth grade. New York is one of only two states where it's 16 years sentenced as an adult. Um, when I went to prison as a teenager, I was two inches shorter. I wasn't shaving yet. I weighed 119 pounds, and I still had braces on my teeth. And when I tell you that I went to a world I didn't know existed, I didn't know it existed. I had no idea. And the movies that you see on TV do not justify what is actually happening there. But I will take it in a very different direction. When I tell people I went to prison as a teenager and grew up there, I got a 24-year sentence. I served 16 of the 24 years. People say, oh my god. But the fact is, it was a very black and brown place. I was in cell blocks, and Sing Sing is the largest cell block in the country. Mm -hmm. I was in galleries of Sing Sing where I was the only white man. And, um, or white kid, depending on how you look at it. Um, I was raised by those men. I wasn't victimized. I wasn't picked on. I was taught about more. I was a confused, mixed up kid. And you know, the cops' kids are the worst. So, that was a joke. Come on. So, I'm the only one left. Yeah, right. So, the fact of the matter is, I was supported by my family. They were there for me but they couldn't be with me. And it was those men in that cell block that made sure I went to work in the morning and got up and made my bed and went to the school building. Those men forced me to go to school. And along the way, when I said, you know, I'm doing it to keep busy, I never thought the college would actually help me. Well, I'm home 10 years now, and I can tell you that I'm the senior fellow for the Center for Social Justice at Mercy Campus. I'm the executive director of the five college programs here in New York. I've just been appointed to the governor's um, reentry group, uh, which I'm hoping will give us some leverage in the work that we're currently doing. And I just finished a documentary that's now uh, won 11 best film and best doc awards. I would not be here today. I would not be here today if I didn't go to school. I would not be here today if those other men in those cell blocks that everyone deemed as worthless didn't raise me and teach me the morals and values I needed to see when I got out, even though most of them are not coming out. And for the officers and staff at Sing Sing, that raised me like I was their own. That's not the story you hear about when you talk about prisons and the prison justice system. Now, don't get me wrong, how will the staff treat me well? Not every prison is the same, but I was in nine different maximum prisons before I was 22. And I can tell you from someone that served 16 years in nine different prisons, everyone's a little different, every person a little different, but I was treated, I was treated like a human being for the most part. And I was blessed to go through that experience because I would not be here today if I didn't go to prison, I'd probably be dead. Questions for Sean. Uh, I have a question. I'd like to know about your father. Now, your father was a policeman. My mom and my dad. I was, I was listening to your father. Well, he's my Long Island yeah. chapter president. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Damon Jones. I'm the New York representative of Blacks and Law Enforcement of America. Blacks and Law Enforcement of America is a national organization of black law enforcement professionals. Our main goal is to build that bridge between community and law enforcement. We are from the community. We also believe in that police officers should live in the community that they serve. We believe that law enforcement should reflect the community. If the community is 75% people of color, the police department should reflect that population. Throughout the United States, it doesn't happen. Within New York, especially in West, I live in Westchester County, within the next 30 years, you'll hardly see a black cop on the street. Why is that? Because of the relationship between young black men and women and the police department. It's a toxic relationship. The other day, when the cop was killed in Jersey City, and the wife or girlfriend of the murderer, when she said what she said, Trust me, 
that is going on in the communities of color when it comes to the police department. I was on a radio show in, out of Washington, D.C., and uh, recently four black New York State parole officers was held at gunpoint while they had their New York State parole vests on, their badge around their neck, and in the New York State parole car, was stopped by the police, pulled out of the car, put on the ground, and held at gunpoint for 30 minutes. Even after one of the police or police departments, own officers identified one of them, said, I know that guy, he is a, he is a parole officer. They still kept him there for, for 30 minutes. Now, if this can happen to black law enforcement with a badge around their neck, if this can happen when they have when they're in a patrol car, we can not even imagine what's what's happening to our young black men and our young black women out on the street. The stories that they don't say. That's why we have programs. It used to be, what do you do when you stop by the police? It's because of so many young black men are being shot, shot, or killed by police. We changed it to, how do you survive police confrontation? to try to teach young kids what to do, what to say, and how to get home safe. Because every police officer has what they call policies and procedures. And what and what is that policy and procedure to make sure that you protect your behind and you get home safe? Our children should now have those same policies and procedures when confronted by a police officer. Because we are losing too many young men and women to confrontations with law enforcement. We just saw what last week, the video of the cop pummeling a grandmother on the ground. I'm a correction officer. I've been working for 25 years. You don't have to pummel somebody to put cuffs on. You don't have to do that. And then two years ago, you had the senior, Kenneth Chamberlain Sr. He pushed his life alert button by mistake. The cops came to the door, and then they ended up killing him. And the whole episode was recorded on a life alert machine. They called them racial names. These are the police officers. You would have thought that it was a gang outside their door. But there wasn't any charges brought on the police officers. The DA found no reason to press charges. And the DA also said that calling him an uh, N-word was a means to distract him, it was a tactic. This is from the DA's office. So what do you think when people see that? What do you think about the police? What do you think about their community being policed? So we use our organization to continue that bridge because if our community or the Latino community or other communities or, or basically poor communities, if they don't see law enforcement criticizing and holding their brothers and sisters accountable, there will be more shooting of, of, of police officers. There will be more people trying to kill police. Everybody called um, the brother out in California, Donor, crazy. When he flipped, we're not condoning what he did to the LA police officers, but if you read his manifesto and you really talk to black cops off the record, they will say everything that he said was correct. What black cops go through in these police departments what we go through on a daily on, on a daily basis seeing the racism and, di and, and discrimination and, and and the civil rights violations and and the problem the problem is most of the people that they do it to are poor people they can't afford a good lawyer they can't pay, spend ten to fifteen thousand dollars for for a good lawyer and, and they fight the case so what they do they cop they cop out they take it on the chin and they go back on the street and then they're a victim down the line. Now, being in corrections, like my brother Dan said, corrections don't correct anybody. They really don't correct anybody. They had a program in, in, in our jail, and they was teaching people how to take interviews and, 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 and shop for jobs. And one of the inmates said, Mr. Jones, I got 83 misdemeanors. Why am I in this program? Mm -hmm. I got 83 misdemeanors. Nobody's going to hire me. Some of the programs are just about numbers, keeping the bodies in the program so they can continue to get the federal grant money. But when them kids go out, the street, out in the street, 
they really have any they really don't have any skills. And then they might stay out of, out of trouble for about six or seven months. I give that I give them about six or seven months, then they go back to the same thing and then they're back in, and then they're back in jail. We need programs like Sean to be in all facilities. But we also need correction management to be proactive on those programs also. Now, we talk about jail being a money maker. Many jails are privatized. They're, they're corporations. Corporations are people too. And they want to make money. New York, New York State is, is one of the few states that has the anti-privatization bill for, for, for local county jails and, and state. So there's really not that profit, that, that profit looking at it. But if you deal with in, in the Midwest or in the West Coast, there, there are a lot of privatized jails. And they spend a lot of money lobbying. The whole big immigration push was from the privatized jails so they could fill those jails up. But we're not addressing it on a national level. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about that on a national level. And we're not talking about the continuation of young black males being killed by police. I mean, you hear about it almost every day. I mean, that's something that needs to be brought to the UN because the police departments now are like extensions of the army. We got rid of the, of the nice shirt and, and the tie and the shiny shoes and, and we put on fatigues now. And we and, and we able to walk around with an M16 and, and, and walk in the projects with a, with a rifle out, you know, showing force. When, Bratton, when Commissioner Bratton said, Oh, we're going to put 500 officers out on the street. That really don't stop crime because they just wait till the 500 officers go. Because I've seen it before. That doesn't stop crime. You have to have a proper relationship with the community if you want to stop crime. You have to have politicians that will really truly understand the correlation between poverty and crime and violence. And if, and if they're not going to understand that poverty plays a role in crime and violence, and proper education. See, I live in the hood. I still live in the hood. So I would like to know that that kid that I see every day, he, when he comes out of jail, he's trained in something. It only costs $15,000 to go to Westchester Community College. Instead of sentencing a kid for two years to sit in Westchester, Westchester County Jail, why don't you sentence him to get a degree? I don't know. We don't do that. It's cheaper, because I make $120,000 with overtime. So it's cheaper to send him to Westchester Community College than to pay me and to sit and watch him. But those are the things that we need to talk about, the, the, the alternatives, so these kids can come out and be productive citizens and, 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 and gain skill. But it's, it's the constantly, they just want numbers. They just want numbers. And, and, and we need to really address that. And I think another thing is to really put on um, on agenda is, is the relationship between law enforcement. Because I truly believe that after 9-11, they had backdoored the posse comitatus rule where you cannot use the police departments as standard armies. Homeland Security backdoored that. That's, what, that's why they have Homeland Security. Because when they had the, the what was it, the Occupy Wall Street marches throughout, the police departments were coordinated through Homeland Security. They're not supposed to do that. You can't use police as standing armies. And that's what, that's what the United States government did. So now the police departments are actually an extension of the United States government. And we're not seeing it. So the protect and serve is, is, out, of the, is out of the door and is, and is basically contained and controlled. And that's what our police departments is. Thank you. Thank you.